Sports, and we are now joined by Ian Underwood, the guy who makes my head hurt all the time. Greg, I want to say thank you very much for stopping in. Have fun. I'm going to get out of here at some point so I can go walk around because I want to see stuff. After we're done with Ian, you can take a little break, and we'll just keep talking to whoever's here. Yeah, because this is my first time here at Liberty Forum. No I've, way. And I've never been to Porkfest well, either. Can, he can show How you around. How is that possible? You should go take a look at, at Shaolin. Bad Ruffles. timing. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the question is is whether or not the value he places upon his wares is less than the money that's in my pocket. I don't think that's going to be a winning equation on not today. my part. Not today. <laughs> that's why we have to persuade you. Or we could just get the government to require you to buy one. Like, that would work. Like, like Switzerland. Would work. Or well, healthcare, actually. Well, <laughs> the problem is do I have enough Benjamins in my pocket to make that trade? The answer is no. You know, we also do barter. It's says New Hampshire. There might be some services that you could provide for us. You want to you want to advertise on uh, uh, you know, Grok Talk it could be Granite advertising. Grok? I mean, we had talked about you know using you as a test case for our training program, and you would <laughs> film that. So, you know, there you know, I for, would be open to that because I have never really done any long distance shooting. Right, and one part of our market is people who want to get into long distance shooting, but don't really know what they're doing, and they don't want to buy the crappy first rifle and then mm-hmm. just have mm-hmm. to buy the other one later. So why not get the good one to start with? Absolutely. You know, a lot of people tell yeah. me I have no idea what I'm doing. It has nothing to do with shooting either. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, so what, one of the things we want, obviously, is we we want to make some money. We want to sell some guns, but we also want those guns to be in the hands of people who actually know what they're doing. Right, <laughs> and coming back to that, <laughs> you know, to love doing it. Yeah, and oh. we love doing it. But oh, I do no. like shooting. I mean, but you can't get into something like long distance shooting and not like it, you know, because it is. It's such a meditative thing. It is. Right. We were just talking to some reporter about this. That you're just, you go out, you're shooting, you're not doing anything but shooting. You're not thinking about your job. You're not thinking about anything that's going wrong. You're not thinking about the car that needs to be fixed. There's you. There's the target, there's the sights, there's the trigger. That's it. Oh, no, the last time I shot anything beyond a 25-yard indoor <laughs> range was at a rock quarry. I had just purchased a, an, a Colt AR. Okay. And oh, I, yeah, and I was it, able to trouble with it in the cold weather, I remember. Yeah, yeah, but then yeah. there was another time when it, w- it fired off very well, and, uh, you know, shooting at gr- big granite blocks, you know, 100, 200 yards away, all you could hear was me laughing like a hyena. Because it was fun. It's fun. It's I mean, and that's the thing. You know, oh, I'm much whole. better long distance shooting. I mean, not good by any stretch. I mean, I can actually hit things, you know. Yeah. Uh, with a handgun, if you're 25 yards away, I can hit you. Any far as I forget it, I'm not going to hit you. Yeah, see, I'm much better <laughs> at a pistol because that's how I, that was a few years ago. The most esteemed wife and I started to do that, okay. and we started, I started off with a 9. She had a 22. She's got a 380. I have several handguns now. Uh-huh. But, you know, I am decent for an advanced beginner or mm-hmm. low-end intermediate. I, and I yeah. have a ton of fun doing it. I, I'm just learning to do the rifle stuff. So Fun I'd, is important. Yeah. Huh? Fun is important. Fun's oh, important. It's and, and training t- helps. And money to the ammo is training important, too. I mean, money <laughs> to the ammo. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, training helps a lot. And one of the things that uh, we do just informally, not through the company, really. Um, in fact, we have a friend who's a uh, doctor at Dartmouth, and one of the things he does is he gets into discussions with residents, and it's like, oh, have you ever shot a gun? No? Why don't you come over to my friend's house? And they come over, and we show them exactly how everything works. Now, they're medical students. They're interested in how things work. So you show them, here's how a gun is designed. Here's mm-hmm. what makes it work. Here's how rifling works. Here's how this works. This is how you're safe around it. These are all the rules. This is how you keep from doing anything terrible. And then you go out, and you get them to shoot. And they follow directions, because mm-hmm. they're good at that. And they're hitting everything. And they walk away thinking, man, I got to get one of these, (laughs) you know? But a a little bit of instruction goes a long way. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, this could be a trade that we could make with you, you know, that you'll be one of our test cases and you're going to be part of our advertising is you buy the gun, but we stand behind it. And by stand behind it, we mean we will help you learn to shoot this thing. (laughs) Well, that's cool. And and I will uh, say that we did put the video up of uh, when you were out in – Las Vegas at the sh- at um, okay the, shot, what, show. Was it? Shot, shot show yeah the shot yep. show and unfortunately the the audio wasn't so great yeah but uh, it was still it was <laughs> you know from the hundreds of people that were showing off their wares that they would pick you to put it up I thought was a a, a good yeah. honor yeah very cool 
so that's, yeah, that was very, that's nice for us. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. So yeah. So when I get the chance, I'm going to boogie out of here. I I do what uh, when I saw that your name was on the list of being here, I said I I can't afford it, but I can at least <laughs> touch it. Yeah. Maybe. You know, go over and and <laughs> that's a part aura. of it, right? Ah. I mean, you know, and part of what we're doing is we're not going the tactical black route. You know, this is not the thing you use to break down somebody's door. I mean, these are pretty rifles. These are very elegant. They're functional. Elegant pieces of art. They are. They they yeah. look wonderful. They feel so wonderful. So tell us, what what is it that you do at Shaolin for the audience? I actually do more paperwork than anything. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, all of us are involved in product design. But Cameron does most of the, the fitting. Um, he's the one who knows the most about shooting. He's the one who really understands what makes a big difference. Okay, let's back up a little bit. For those folks, uh, we all know, because we know you, mm -hmm. and again, I look at you as the person who is most likely to make my head hurt when I listen to you. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah, you do it well. <laughs> but what does Shaolin Rifle Works sell? Okay, what we sell are the most accurate ARs in the world. Okay. So these are in 308, 556, and uh, 300 blackout calibers. Okay. So we guarantee the, on the 556 and the 308, we guarantee that it will shoot one half MOA or better. So that's a half an inch group at 100 yards. And for those people who are listening that understand what guns do, and I know enough to know that, that is most better than I could do uh, on my own. The gun will be yeah. much better than what I could do. Right. But for those who don't, guys, that's that's really cool shooting. That's it is. that's marksman level yeah and so you know our our take on it is if you missed it's not the rifle yeah i believe <laughs> it know? i the, believe it so in that sense you have no alibi you know ah damn rifle it's not you know Just something's wrong with it. no sight. yeah no if it you out. can if you can you know as jeff cooper's daughter i think said once you know if you can see it you can hit it so that's that's what we're selling um that's what we do so um, my part of it is, as I said, it's mostly, you know, a lot of paperwork, making sure the insurance is up to date, that ATF is not going to come busting down the door because we forgot to fill out a form, things like that. Um, but we're all involved in product design. We sit down and we think about what are the right components to use, why would we choose this component instead of that one. And you'll see the result of those decisions when you pick up the rifle and you feel it, you know. Now, do you, other than assembling, do you make any of your own? We, what we do, the part that we do, apart from fitting, so we actually take the triggers, we make them better. We take uh, the bolt face, we actually true everything up, and what we're looking for is perfection, right? We, we don't want things to meet at, you know, 89.7 degrees. Nine, if it's 90 degrees, it's 90 degrees, right? If it's parallel, it's parallel. Um, and one of the things we do is we profile the barrels. And what that, that's the main thing that contributes to the accuracy because we can make that perfectly concentric to within a half of a thousandth of an inch. So it's not somebody throwing a barrel onto a machine, pushing a button, throwing it into a bin, doing the next one. This is, we have a guy, Neil, who's standing there, and he's measuring this. And before any cutting happens, we know exactly where the ends of that barrel are. So when that gets on the rifle, we know exactly where that, right, where that round coming out of that barrel is going. That's what we do. That's the, the part that we do. And, you know, we're, we're obviously not going to make our own stocks. There's no point in doing that. Magpul makes perfectly good furniture. There's no point in our manufacturing, <laughs> you know, um, a handguard because uh, the one we buy is the one that you would want anyways. So, but what we do is the parts that make a difference, those are under our control. You had a question. Well, it, people my age know the, 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 the term Shaolin. Right. Okay? And you chose the name Shaolin because it was neener neener or <laughs> because it really is reflective of, of the philosophy. It, and it is. I mean, and we say this on our website, right, that you think of, when you think of the monks of the Shaolin Temple, you think of things like grace and power under control and you think of excellence and non-compromising, right? And no, I think of the word not, grasshopper. <laughs> okay, right, or, or yeah. David Carradine hanging <laughs> yeah. in a closet in Thailand. Right, so there is, there is the whole popular culture thing to be overcome. But yeah, we were after that. And in fact, I'm a, a Wing Chun Kung Fu instructor, and that is something out of the Shaolin Temple, which yeah. you know embodies this, the same principles of you know simplicity and power, not doing more than you need to do, but doing everything that you need to do, and using force properly. Using force properly, right? So yes, and yes, the that 
there is an element of peace behind <laughs> being well armed, right? That you and that is the dichotomy that the left and the anti gunners just don't seem to get. They just don't understand the underlying philosophy of not only is self defense our right, it is a responsibility. And it's that part that they don't get because they feel well society is responsible. You know what's for wrong with them, right? They think that if they had a firearm, like these are the crazy ones, that the first time they went off on somebody that they'd take it out and gun them down. And and that's right. really what it is. Now I I'm that's armed. That's what David right? Pierce said on right. the Senate floor. Exactly. That, that that you know, if 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 he saw that, that you had a uh, a handgun on open carry, he wouldn't fight you for the parking space. Yeah, the but only if he time didn't I see it, he would <laughs> he would engage in violence to win that. <laughs> yeah, that parking that's crazy. Space. They're, They're going, nuts. Whoa, whoa, they shouldn't whoa, whoa, have whoa, guns, these people. <laughs> but but I don't know if you guys read PJ Media. Forgive me for it. For Sometimes this, but today, I do. This morning there was an article about what the left doesn't understand about Heinlein. And of course, <laughs> of course, they go into the discussion of of of, the, of stranger in a strange land mm-hmm. and the concept of grokking, but but importantly, they talked about Heinlein, and and he said that I haven't changed. It's just everybody else, the right and the left, have moved away from me. So there wasn't a shift in his political philosophy. He has stayed the same. But everybody else has just gone over the side. But Highland says an armed society is a polite society. You never know what you're willing to do if you have to back up your, your life, right? Back it up with, right. with your life. So the whole concept of the serenity of knowing that you are capable and willing only if pushed or forced to defend your life, Well, that's, that's you the point. Can. It's, it's the peace of mind. It's and, peace. and they don't. You know, I I carry my firearm everywhere I legally can, mm-hmm. and I never want to take it out except to shoot it at a target, ever. But right. if not, circumstances do not unholster your gun right. unless you're prepared. Exactly. Shoot. There's no reason to. Right. And all these, you know, you see on the movies, and and the guy's got his, got the bad guy there, and, he, and he's and he's holding the gun on him, right? No, <laughs> no, just shoot him. Yeah. You don't stand there and reason with him. So, the, I mean, and not or that, leave. that violent. But yeah. the idea <laughs> is that... Well, you, know, that, you don't have to shoot yeah. him. You know, you but, you bring, yeah. but Ian, that is the most important lesson. Now, yes, it is. Uh, I right. congratulate you on your stature in Kung Fu. <laughs> um, I used to do a lot of Taekwondo. Mm-hmm. Many years in... Not that many pounds ago. <laughs> now, um, actually, it's a whole lot less. But anyways, that's the first thing. The whole idea is to know your situation and to be able to not have to engage. And that's sure. what the left doesn't understand. Exactly. They don't understand that. David Pierce will fight you for a parking space if he doesn't know you're armed. <laughs> I mean, he said he would literally fight you for it? Yes, and we have it on tape. Wow. He said it on the Senate floor. And we're thinking, well, 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 wait a minute. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Cognitive dissonance. If I see that they have an open carry, I'm not going to fight him for the parking space. Yes, but he should know know better. They probably are concealed carry. No, 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 no. no. (laughs) And he said, but but if he doesn't see it, he's willing to engage in aggression. Now. (laughs) What an idiot. (laughs) Well, I'm not sure he thought it through. This segment's for you, Mr. Pierce. But we will run that until the world ends because Mm -hmm. that's the whole point. The left, if you're not capable of defending yourself, will beat you over the head. Mm -hmm. Okay, Think about that. If that (laughs) does not encapsulate the entire liberal progressive philosophy, if you are unarmed, I can beat you up. Well, here's here's putting it a different way. Not not him. (laughs) No. No, no. But in general... (laughs) There is no limiting principle for progressives, is what it comes down That's to. That's the other but theme they we've had. prefer you right. unarmed. That's well. the theme we've had for a long time now, too, as well. When, when is enough enough? Right. Just, there is, is no enough. enough. There is no enough. There isn't. There'll never enough money. There's never enough regulation. There's never enough interference. Never Ever. enough of government. Well, Ever. And that's, I mean, this is actually what I'll, sort of what I'll be talking about later today. Um, you know, you're coming in different directions, right? If you're starting from the direction where you say, here are my five or six principles, then that is enough. 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to add to those. I've <laughs> already said basically, you know, you have certain rights, <laughs> you have certain responsibilities, and wherever that goes, that's where it takes us. If your orientation, though, is not to work forward from first principles, but to work back for, from results and say, I will start adding principles ad hoc as I need them and not worry about <laughs> consistency, there literally is never enough, right? Mm -hmm. Because when is everything good enough? Never. Never. There's always something. There's some poor person who could be elevated. There's some person that you think is being And that's the ultimate lie of the right. utopia. You can well, never achieve it. Right. And so, th <laughs> but that, it's an excellent question to ask, you know, well, when is enough? And I, I think if I were to step into that, that orientation, I would say, well, there's, there never is enough because there, there's always going to be improvement that can be made. And the difference then is what you think of as improvement. Mm -hmm. Right? Are you improving <laughs> the foundation or are you adding things on and not worrying about how that's going to collapse later? So right. I don't even think you can fault them for saying, you know, enough is enough. It's just the way they're thinking about it, right? So they value something differently than you. You value principles. They value outcomes. It's not that one of those is wrong. It's just well, you guys. You know, the battle is in the middle where people are, who don't understand that well, yes. all of their liberties and freedoms are subject to sacrifice at right. the whim of people who can't stop. Right. But from, from where I sit, mm -hmm. I look at that and, and I think the discussions are wrong, right? The discussions are all about some particular issue, education, mm -hmm. guns, unions, something. And what they're not doing is backing up and saying, do I actually care about consistency? <laughs> do I actually care about the rule of law, for instance? Do I actually care about the fact that I should be able, that all of us, if we're asked a question about what's legal, must come to the same answer? Do I care about that? Because if I don't care about that, and I haven't asked whether I care about that, then we can mm -hmm. just fight all day. Yeah, and, right? and it's an important point. We've, we've been talking about it internally uh, this last week. I got very depressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's probably about as low as any of you have ever seen me. I, I'm still... It's like everything going on. And, you know, then there's Congressman Louis, Louis Gutierrez, Gutierrez. from oh, yeah, uh, Chicago, yeah. who is just so thrilled that Chicago has declared itself or has absolved itself from having to follow the law concerning illegal immigration. And I'm thinking, I cannot remember the last time in my lifetime that I heard a, co a sitting congressman saying, we screwed over the rule of law. What? Well, I mean, that's, that's impressive to admit it. Well, not impressive that he admits it. He glorifies himself in mm. it. It's a good week for him oh, then, too, I see. because so he this got... is a good thing. Yeah, Although... and, and now you've got the Obama administration lying because they told the judge when the judge said, you can't do this, it's an overreach. Oh, well, you're, we already did it for 100,000 uh, illegal immigrants that we gave them all this stuff. We just didn't tell you. <clears throat> right. Well, maybe, you know, what they might be hoping for there is sort of the, what appears to be now the, uh, the willingness of, of courts to grandfather things, right? So if you look at the McDonald and the Heller yeah. dis decisions, and they say, well, yeah, so we've decided that the right to keep and bear arms is an individual right. It's not connected to a militia, and it's not for, for sport. It's for self-defense. However, certain longstanding prohibitions... You know, this is we we aren't questioning those, mm -hmm. which is to me just a, <laughs> I, I'm just flabbergasted. It's to even cutting read the baby in like half. That. Well, it, it's it's almost like if you said, well, we we passed this amendment saying that you can't have slavery, but you know what? If there are states that have had it for a long time, we're we're going to let them <laughs> keep going, right? Or we've decided that abortion should be legal unless it hasn't been in a certain place, which turns the whole thing on its head, right? This idea, but maybe that's what they're hoping for. It's like, well, we've been doing it for a long time, therefore it doesn't really matter yeah. whether it's prohibited because it, it's it, traditional. In any case, it trashes the rule of law. Go ahead, Susan. There's a great T-shirt for sale in the, in the vendor room that says, Kill the Precedent. <laughs> well, yeah. Precedent. Yeah. Yes, uh, we're not exactly... Oh, see, we're not. Well, I thought you meant P R E S S, no, no, which no, is no, 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 no. which is pr pretty much the same tactic that we've been doing for years but, as well. But if if you accept that precedence rules the future, sure. And this okay. is, I mean, there's a whole. You can't. So so, you know, it it is or it isn't, right? It's oh. either. Well, a there's half a thing. Of a thousandth of an inch. Sure. Or it's not. Yes. Or it's not. Yes. Well, see, that's the problem. That's our problem. We believe in absolute values. Either it's the hundred thousandths of an inch or, or whatever it is, or it's not. Sure. But there's then a willingness. I mean, it's... They don't... They've brought 
into the mainstream and have almost overcome the culture with relativism. So sure. there cannot be a standard. There cannot be, a, you know, oh. it would be a fair fight if they had their foundation, we had our foundation. Our foundation on base principles doesn't change. Theirs moves all over the place. Sure, but there's, there's a willingness, right? And so, again, this is something I'll, I'm spilling beans I'll be talking about later. But um, so there is a willingness. That's all right. We'll keep it quiet. We won't okay. tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I don't want to spoil the surprise. But there is a willingness at some point um, when you're confronted with the idea that something you believe has taken you in a direction that you don't want to go, there are two ways to deal with that. One of them is to say, well, no, I didn't mean it. I, I will go back and change what I apparently believe to get the different outcome. And the other way is to say, okay, you know what? I get an outcome I don't like, but it doesn't invalidate the principle, right? It just means I got something I didn't like, and I have to find a way to deal with that. And those are two very different ways of looking at the world, right? It, it goes back to the whole, you're never done. If what you're looking at is the outcomes and you have, you've given yourself the freedom to say, oh, well, I guess maybe some people don't have a right to self-defense or maybe arms only means pointed sticks or, you know, all persons doesn't really mean all persons, right? If you give yourself the freedom to do that, then you can always go back and shift your set of principles to whatever you think is going to give you satisfaction right then. The problem is, is that a lot of people on the left don't have a conscience, a con they don't have that conversation with themselves at a conscious level to say, I am experiencing cognitive dissonance by holding multiple things that are incompatible that... Uh, well, they're not even incompatible. And who's teach it's, it's not that it's incompatible. So let's say I say, for example, you know what? If you're a person, you have a right to self-defense. And it follows, if you have the right to self-defense, you have the right to actually own tools to do that. So, are you a convicted felon? Yes. Are you a person? Yes. A convicted felon, therefore, has the right to keep and bear arms. And then you look at that and people just panic and go, well, that can't be right. Okay? And the, the difference is the willingness. Don't you take my A-10 away from me. You know, the willingness to actually admit that sometimes you don't get what you want. Right? That, to me, is the, the line. Right, you're you're on one side of that line or the other. Either you, you say, "Look, I have these principles, and and I I am playing this game because I want to play this game, not because of the outcomes that it will give me." Okay, or I'm playing this game because I want a certain outcome, and if I have to play Calvin Ball and change the rules every five minutes, then that's <laughs> what I'm going to do. Yeah. Right. But, uh, but, but it's that it's that willingness. This is the thing. And who teaches this? Who teaches this idea anymore that sometimes you stick to a principle even though you know the outcome is going to suck? Okay, and here's the thing that, that gets to me is you, you can look around and you take a word like integrity or honor, right? Somebody drops a grenade in a room and some people are like, I'm getting out of the room. And some people are looking at that and thinking honor requires me to protect everybody. Now yes. that he's not jumping on that grenade because it's a good outcome for him, right? Correct. That outcome sucks. Mm -hmm. like but, the Peralt. but the game that he is playing is not get the good outcome. The game he is playing is be true to these principles. Who teaches that now? Nope. Nobody, Nobody teaches that. And that and that is a real. Uh, that goes back to the base foundation that I think a lot of us, well, all of us sitting here right now, understand that those are base foundational principles that you, you may violate them, mm -hmm. but you know this is going to hurt if I do. Right. And it does make it does impact you. I mean, just going back to your idea of okay, a felon is a person who should have self-defense rights and the cons uh, this is where I have the problem I'm conservative with libertarian leadings and an evangelical Christian and sometimes those things don't all match up very mm -hmm. well and I know that and the more I do the politics the more that uh, it, it brings me into conflict because I know there are some felons if it's like a white collar type felony yeah probably okay but the guy who's already shot 10 people I'm so here's a question. Why is he out on the street? Why is Because he has been adjudicated to have paid his penalty to society. And I already know where you're going to take this. <laughs> you know, is, is the point of that system to make people pay a penalty? Or is the point of that system right. to take people who are obviously nuts and segregate them from society? But In the, which case, how much sense does it make to say, well, you just you know, raped and killed your wife and killed your three kids. And after I put you away for 10 years... 
you'll be fine. Right, and that's that's, <laughs> that's insane. I mean, in, in just the the literal meaning right. of that word, insane. It makes no sense. Right, and you know, I was going to bring up recidivism because it is a truth factor. How do you protect society from that? And I think, you know, as much as the left says we incarcerate too many people, well, guess what? We've got a classic classroom example of that in California where they released all these people. And guess what, folks? Crime has soared 20%, especially on the violent crimes. But listen to the word you're using. How do we protect society? We don't protect society. Society is made of individuals who protect themselves and assist each other in protecting themselves. Out in California, they've been denied <laughs> Okay, <that>. I know. <laughs> Except my friend who keeps – every right. time she goes off and goes to another state – she brings back more things that can protect herself that would be illegal in sure. California. <laughs> right. But I'm just saying, as I always do, listen to the words. Even people, even, and what I'm suggesting here is the words you're using, the phrases that people have given you to use, you're not listening to what. The, this is why he makes my head hurt. You know? You've got to stop and listen to what's you do. coming you out do. of your you mouth. You do. And say, what do those words mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have. And unfortunately, I don't have enough time in the day to do it all. <laughs> but, but yeah, so this is, this is, I think, one of the things. And when you find yourself, you know, in conflict, there's this stuff I believe, there's this stuff I believe, there's this. I think if you look a lot of times at the language and you rephrase what it is you believe, yes. you may find that there you, are no contradictions, that those are all resolved. And a lot of that is just a linguistic problem. It's just sloppy language. It is, and, or in my part, sloppy thinking. You know? And those are related, right? If you read Richard Mitchell, and if you haven't, I highly recommend anybody read Richard Mitchell's two books. Um, <laughs> less books? Than words, less books? Than words, I read 100 blog sites a day. Okay. Books? <laughs> <laughs> These are small books, and they're little jewels. So I are mean, posts. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Well, some of them get um, rather long, yeah. especially by me. Right. But, I mean, he's the guy who, who turned me onto this in college. I was wandering around in a bookstore, and I found this book called Less Than Words Can Say. And I read it, and it my head turned. I mean, it's the kind of experience that you... I'm, give, I'm, I'm paying that forward, right? He oh, thanks, just... Uh, my <laughs> head, it was like it just... Somebody turned me 90 degrees and then 90 degrees again, and nothing looked the same to me after I read that book. Uh, I, I mean, we, we all should be going through this instead of just floating on the waters of life being tossed to and fro. It, it does take time. It does take a certain level of honesty to be able to think these things through as you're trying to decide. And it, some of it very much is a compromise because this is not utopia. We will mm-hmm. not be in utopia. But I think from my standpoint, I need to think these things through mm-hmm. and understand I can't get to that utopia, that there are going to be some sure. contradictions and there are going to be some limitations. That doesn't mean I can't propose to go as far as I can, Absolutely. but there are going to be certain value sets that I have that say, and I know what the political se- says, but I know what the, my moral belief says right. as well. What's important about that is that there's lots of people where you are, and if you can communicate to them in a way that's right. meaningful to them, you can bring them on your journey. But I, I would also like, I'm going to give you a little distinction that you can make. You can just carry this oh, around. Oh, he's going to pick on me again. No, no, no. No, this is, I'm just, these are things that I've learned over time, right? So there's a distinction in my mind, at least, between compromise and rationalization. Compromise yes. is when you say, look, you know, somebody is pointing a gun at me and saying I have to give him my wallet. And maybe I could do something about this. I'm going to compromise. I'm going to hand over my wallet, even though I don't believe he has a right to it, as opposed to, rationalizing it and saying, well, he's probably had a hard life. He has a family to feed. So it's really not a wrong thing for this, right? And those, to me, that's a very important distinction. It's one thing to say, I know that what I'm doing is not the principled thing, but I am compromising. I am... It's a conscious decision. Uh, it's a see, conscious decision. See, you've got me all wrong. Right? You know what the first thought is <laughs> for me? I can no longer stick my right foot in his <laughs> left ear. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are very good points. Yes. And, and it does make my head hurt. The it first does. time I ever heard you speak, I was going, what? <laughs> <laughs> my head doesn't hurt at all. No, okay. no, yeah. no. No, it's like, w- w- wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted to, to, to fight with you about it. Interesting. And, and I'm thinking, 
He's right. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it terrified me. And the first time we spoke at one of our gun rallies, I was, people were sitting in the audience, some in that first row, and there were other people standing around going, who is this guy? And, and they didn't know if he were a murderer or, or an anarchist or had just been let out of some crazy place because the things that you said, it's hard to face inconsistent thinking. It's hard to face going... Everything, not everything, but many of the things that I believe to be right, while they may be right, I believe it for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. and, it's a, and it's a very difficult, uncomfortable, maybe more than anything, you, you made me so uncomfortable that I had to go back and go, I wanted to read it. I said, let me have, the, let me right. have it and read it and read it. And that first, first one of your pieces that went up, on granite rock. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. It did. You know what else is oh, my goodness? We're out of time. Well, no, we're not oh. out of time. We just have to take, take a quick break. For this, for this segment. And, uh, well, we're, we've got... Screw the clock. We're, we're done. Yeah, we're, not, we're not really <laughs> worried about that so much. Okay. Yeah, because we're on extra time at this point. Okay. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. I just, I have so let me put, in, put in a plug for a, a new book that I'm writing, which might help you. It's, a, it's an actual diet book. And the way that it works is you simply don't swallow anything. You put the food in your mouth, you chew it, you get the flavor, you spit it out. I expect that to be a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> now he wants to make my stomach hurt. Right. It's, it's real good with the binge and purge crowd because it skips a step. Right. There's, it, there's not this uncomfortable stomach acid coming up. You, but isn't that what it? chefs do in a kitchen anyway? Think of it this way. It's like a contraceptive for your mouth. <laughs> oh, you had not been here the, uh. earlier this morning. Maybe, maybe David Pierce will come up with Bill. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll make this mandatory. Well, I want to say thank you for stopping by, Ian. You, I, you're always welcome to come on Grok okay. Talk whenever uh, something comes that. up or submit something for, for Granite Grok. I do want to get out of here. I do yeah. want to meet you over at your uh, booth to, to say hello okay. and go. Well, that's where I'm Ooh. heading now. So thanks Ooh. for having me on. Yeah, thank you. Let's, let's see. We can put in some music for me and so everybody can take up stretch legs. Let me just test it to see how loud it's going to be. All righty. And, and folks, we're, we're going to be back in just a few minutes. We are Granite Rock. Is that down all the way? Grok Talk? Yeah, pretty much. And we'll be back. All right, we're just going to let that play for a few minutes. So stay tuned. We'll be back. <laughs> 